Uh, we welcome back uh, Simon Perkins again. Um, to this time, uh, give us, you know, more, I think, technical overview focus demo uh, of, of parallel radio astronomy application development with Dask and Number. I've seen uh, there have been already some discussion going on after your, your first talk, Simon, about using Dask. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there will be a lot of a lot of questions. Um, yeah, uh, I, you can start your demo in terms of answering uh, questions. You know, um, I guess would you like to handle them as they as they come in? Yeah, I think I'd be pretty happy to handle them as they come in. Um, I just haven't been offered the option to share my uh, screen. Oh no. I can just share it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Mitu. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to go. I'll try to go into a bit more detail um, what I about what I discussed in my talk. Um, but I think the whole philosophy behind Dallas Gomez and Codex Africanus is that one uh, tries to build these. Uh, one tries to chain dask arrays together to create radio astronomy applications. And dask um, obviously provides the data access layer to, um, to, to data that lives on disk, while codex is the, um, uh, are the algorithms that transform that data, um, which then gets um, written back to disk. So, if one were to write an application, you could see that like, we start off with some imports and we will do things like uh, import task MS or import the XPS from MS and XPS from the table functions from task MS. Um, I'm also going to use ZAR because it's um, just faster uh, than, than using the MS as it stands. I'm, I'm not very familiar with setting up classical on a cluster, so it's quite possible that we haven't configured Castle Core properly. But uh, just I think for the purposes of a fast demo, ZAR works very nicely. And then from Africanus, which is the uh, algorithms library, you can see we can import functions like RAID to LM or our phase delay function. Or um, in particular, we've got uh, we've we've wrapped um, a W gridder. Bye. Sorry, Simon. So, sorry to Hi. interrupt. Uh, we've got we've got two two requests. So, so first request is: Could you speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Because there is a bit of a bit, bit of an echo. Um, All right. How yeah. Does that oh, sound? Yeah, that sounds much better. And the second much one uh, is: Would it be possible to increase a bit the font size of the notebook? Because it is, especially I don't have for you in full screen. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, if if that works for you. Uh, I think I think this is this is much much better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So so the idea is that one um, would write um, radio astronomy applications um, you know, in a functional uh, style. But uh, so, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Just getting my train of thought back. So um, in particular, we've wrapped this uh, W gridder by. Uh, the Max Planck people, uh, particularly uh, Martin Reinick has written this W gridder. It's integrated in W's clean, um, but it's a very accurate and uh, highly performant W gridder. So one can import these um, interfaces or, or functions um, from Africanus, and they'll be used to transform or, or or apply transforms to dask arrays. And I think that was one of the questions that Sergio was asking uh, in the chat. So <clears throat> one of the nice things about the dask ecosystem, there's a, there are a lot of um, packages out there for setting up uh, dask on clusters. In this case, I'm gonna be using a PBS cluster at the Center for High Performance Computing in Cape Town. Um, and it, this looks easier than it might be because actually there, there, there are a bunch of set of files in the background. But if once you've got things set up, you can literally do something like cluster equals PBS cluster um, and, and give it some environment variables or, or in environment 
commands to run uh, when your work, your task work is start, which and, and this happens when you ask the cluster to scale your job. So you say, I want 10 nodes. And what will what all happen is that'll spin up 10 workers um, on the cluster. And that does take, uh, tend to take some time. Um, but once, uh, or even before that is that has happened, one can connect a client to the scheduler. So here I'm going client, I'm, I'm creating client that attaches to the cluster and uh, what one can do is request that the scheduler and the workers restart themselves. Uh, I'm not going to do that yet but uh, at the moment we've got a, a cluster with 10 workers with 240 cores and about 1.2 terabytes. Um, they're all uh, on an InfiniBand connection and on a Lustre file system and if I go to this DAS workers tab you should be able to see them all started up here and waiting to do some compute. Um, for this demo, I'm going to create a dirty image uh, or a couple of dirty images. This is a, a standard process in radio astronomy. It's, it's the first step one takes in uh, creating a, a final image. Um, I also want to <clears throat> just clarify that I'm not a radio astron astronomer. I come from a computer science background. So um, this is very much uh, toy radio astronomy and it reflects my, <laughs> my, some of my ignorance. But, but the idea is that what, what we're developing here is useful for power users who will go and on and uh, make uh, very beautiful images. Okay, so I think I've mentioned the W Bridger, um, W stacking. Uh, I, I should also note that uh, we've turned W stacking off just to make things faster for demo purposes. Um, if you turn it on, um, the, the image is more accurate. So then in terms of the actual code for creating a dirty image, uh, generally we work from sort of from a data set, usually, uh, or uh, the, the standard, I think, these days is to work from a measurement set. But um, as I mentioned earlier, I've converted this to a ZAR data set. Uh, this is pretty easy to do with DaskMS, as I mentioned in the presentation. One just uh, creates the data sets uh, with an XDS from MS and then convert them to ZAR in the following way. Um, but I've done that up front. And then one can reopen those those data sets. Um, I've applied some of my internal magic. Oh, yeah, I've applied some internal magic here just to improve the graph ordering. I think there was a question um, in the chat about that too. Um, and then also what happens here is one loads up the spectral window table or creates a data set from the spectral window table with a spectral and one partitions that per row because generally you've got a spectral window per row in the spectral window to the table. For Meerkat, we're working with a 1.5 degree field of view. We're going to create a 4K by 4K image and I'm just going to do one image in band. Um, set up the cell size, uh, create a small channel frequency array, set up the imaging band. Okay, so at this point, I'm not going to talk about the component model. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a gridding operation. I'm going to demo creating a dirty image from simulated disk visibilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute this block. And, and at this point, nothing is, uh, is executing. This is a lazily constructed graph. So result contains, the, the, the result variable is the array containing the entire graph, which uh, defines our computation. But if you see here, I'm going to say, I want to grid this data. So I'm going to say visibility is, equals, is equal to I, which
which is defined above up here by a blockwise operation, um, computing the flux from a xx plus yy divided by two expression. And I'll, I'm gonna try and answer Sergio's question here. It is essentially with blockwise, one is trying to map functions over blocks of input. So in our data set, we've got the data column from the CASA table. And it has a dimensionality scheme of row, channel, and correlation. And what we, what we want to produce is I or the flux, which will have a row channel dimension, uh, dimensionality. We're going to combine the XX and Y and Y correlations together to produce I. So what, what we're doing here is, is with the flux function, we're defining that transform on a chunk of visibilities. So here we can see that we first copy the XX correlation into the result. Then we add the YY correlation divided by two in return. So this, this, this flux function is going to be applied on each chunk of the data array to produce a, an I task array. So if we go down here, so here we, sh we, we can see that we, if we look at the data column, which is our visibilities on disk, it's a 1.43 terabyte array chunked into 1.3 gigabyte chunks. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's a fair amount of data. data. But then if I add a new cell and take a look at the I array, which is defined as a transformation on the data array, we can see here that uh, it's smaller because we're, we, we've, uh, we, we've created, we, we've, we've dropped our correlations. Uh, we've just created I from two correlations. So it's, it's, it's a quarter of the size. And this is the data that we're going to create. Okay. So I'm going to set this off. Um, as I say, everything has been done lazily up until this point. So now we're going to say result cubic bills result compute. And I'm going to go to this window because I think it displays things a lot better. And then we hope that the live demo works. Okay. Cool. Okay. So it started off already. Um, so what you can see here is these are the czar reads from disk. And this is the application of the dirty wrapper. So th this is the, the W grider actually um, doing the gridding operations. And yeah, so this is going to some time, but yeah, it, it goes through the entire process. And at this point, it's being computed in 48.6 seconds, which I think is actually suspicious. I think I've actually given it the wrong thing. No, is equals I. Okay, so what we should see here. Okay, we are seeing that. Um, so what I've done here by mistake, I feel is I've produced an image from an image model. Um, so let me just rerun that again. So what I'm going to do, and I think this merits discussion, is I'm going to restart the schedule and the workers. Um, because I think what, what we found is that Task workers can become a bit unstable when you give them large chunk sizes. Um, so I think we're still in the process of investigating what the right chunk sizes are. Um, but I think it's important to point out. I'm just going to wait for those workers to come up. Okay, so they've come up. Okay, so now I should be grilling this data. 
Also, uh, what's important to point out is the the final result array is a the, the final result is sixty seven megs. That's the four K by four K image that's coming out. Um, but obviously, we're consuming about one point four three terabytes of data. Okay, now live demo, please work. Okay, yeah, so this seems like it's doing the right thing. So uh, in response to Sergio's uh, question, you can see here there's that flux method that I defined um, in order to uh, compute I from the X, X, and Y, Y, Y correlation. So that's been mapped over the uh, data columns, uh, the visibility data columns. Um, but yeah, so that flux is created and then it's fed into that W grader. W grader, this is the dirty wrapper function. And it's chugging along pretty nicely. So this is consuming 1.43 terabytes of data on disk. And if you can see here, the wall time was one minute, 21 seconds. And it should produce this kind of figure, which isn't very interesting. Because uh, essentially I've got a simulated data set. Uh, sorry, Simon, there is a question that I think is relevant to, to this part that we're covering now. So uh, right. in, in Q&A, can you see the Q&A? Uh, sorry, I haven't, I haven't got okay. that out. Let me just try and find. Where is it? Maybe, maybe I can just, just ask it. So the question yeah. is, did you initialize the flux function with number JIT? Oh yeah, no, that's, that's a fair question. I haven't done it with a number JIT. Um, I could, if you want. Uh, I don't think it's going to change things significantly because these are pretty simple operations, but I could for the purposes of demonstration. Uh, sorry, I'm still trying to find this Q and A. Oh, right, I found it. Um, yeah, let me do that again. Okay, so so import number. Yeah, we say number dot n. So what we're doing is when we say no Python equals true, we're saying we want to compile this down to machine code. Also, what we're going to do is we can say no deal equals true. This drops the global interpreter lock, which is a, another important thing. Um, essentially, Python, uh, the Python interpreter can only execute in a single thread uh, at a time. It can only execute one instruction in a single thread. So what's great about number is that you can write this accelerated machine code, tell it to drop the global interpreter lock while it's executing that machine code. Um, and that means that this, this highly optimal code can uh, disappear uh, onto a single thread uh, while other Python code can execute um, at the same time. Okay, so now we've jitted things. I'm just going to bounce the client again. Yeah, Marco, thanks. That would be very helpful. Let's check if my task workers are up. Okay, so then we can run this.
So the, here we can see this. Uh, so our functions uh, firing up and this flux has been calculated and gridded. Yeah, you know, what's uh, what's interesting to note here: these red, these red uh, tasks are the are, are, are transfers between nodes. But this is auto automatically handled for you by DAS. Just trying to see if I can catch one. Yeah, transfer daily wrap or something. Okay. So that finished up and we should get the same image out. So that took one minute, 20 seconds. Uh, same, uh, same stuff at the phase center. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute a dirty image from component model visibilities, which will use that phase delay function. So this is this component predict over here. I'm going to swap that around put it there, and I'm going to make sure that these are the visibilities that we want to predict. Just balance my, let me start my work using my scheduler for stability. To start this off. So this is like a DFT predict. So it's not uh, it's not as uh, it's not as fast as a W reader. Okay. So uh, I think. In this case, as type. So I think what can be confusing is that task applies optimizations to the, the, the task. So the as type, if we go back to the notebook, you'll see that uh, one computes the phase delay and then uh, computes model, model visibilities, like cost density, complex 64, and then sum over the source dimension. So all of this has been um, optimized into a single task by Dask. Um, so you'll see it here, this as type uh, task is now taking like about 45 seconds per chunk. <coughs> Excuse me. And so yeah, these model visibilities are being predicted and then passed into this uh, daily image calculation. Uh, see yeah, uh, Simon, yeah. we just have uh, about eight minutes left. Uh, okay. Just, just a bit of a time warning. And there are also some questions coming in, in Q&A. Uh, don't know, could, did, you, did you sort out the problem? Can you see them or would you like me to read them? I can see them. Wait? Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay, yeah, uh, uh, let me make a decision on how we're doing for time because the predict does take longer. Um, this might take a minute more. Yeah, that's my demo. I'll, I want to prove that this, that the final result comes out. So while we're waiting for this, there are other tabs here. You can kind of see that uh, you can kind of see what the other work is up to. So generally, you're looking at about twenty-four thousand percent is full utilization. Um, so it's probably utilizing three quarters of the compute power at present. Um, 
we get other sort of tabs, uh, task tab. So this takes a while. Uh, okay, well, this actually shows the run. This this is this is showing previous runs. Um, um, you can also see the graph as it's currently ex executing. So this is what it looks like. Um, and these are tasks. The, the tasks on the left are generally your your ingest operations, while these are your kind of processing operations. Um, you can see it kind of chugging away there. And then you've also got access to uh, other workers or, or, or the worker logs. So you can kind of go and see what's happening on the worker itself. So you can see kind of things here, like, uh, like they've got complaints about workers' streams dying. But yeah, essentially you get a whole bunch of tools for uh, evaluating what's happening while you're running your distributed uh, graph. But I'll try and go back to the main tab at this point. How much time do we have there? Uh, around like uh, uh, I've, I've just moved um, around four and a half minutes. Okay, so I think I'll just use this time to answer questions um, because I think this is this is going to get a, this is going to be a slow run. In fact, let me just stop it and restart the whole thing while I'm doing this. Um, so, okay, so Tamayan had a question. If you wanted to use existing software W's clean, would it need re-implementation in Python? So I think this is, uh, I don't think so. I think the, 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 the highly performant um, parts would uh, obviously need to be implemented in C++, like Martin Reinick has done. Um, I think the important uh, thing here is to implement them in a functional style. So basically, if you think of a C style function that takes um, uh, uh, arguments that you don't mutate and then re uh, produces a, an output array, um, then you can, I think the thing about Dask is that you can plug almost anything into it. Um, so if you can code in that kind of style, then I, I, or, or I, I don't see why uh, th that that wouldn't be possible. And then, okay, the window showing the processing threads looks like a special web server showing this in real time. Is it, is it part of Dask? Okay, so yes, it is. Essentially, they're using a bokeh web server. Um, so the scheduler has this web server uh, running on top of it. And you will see here that one can just go into this, uh, one can go to this web address and uh, get access to that scheduling information. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think my workers have come up yet. I don't want to do this because this is only using one worker. But it seems to be doing reasonably well. Yeah, so I think what I've found preparing this demo is that there, there can be a fair amount of variability between runs. Um, I've seen this predict run in one minute 30 and I've seen it run in like four minutes. So 
Um, that is something that we're still trying to understand at the moment. Um, but maybe that's a good place to stop. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah, there is uh, one more question on, on, on the Q&A that I think you know, we've got we've got maybe a minute to to answer. Oh, is that Peter's question? No, no, yeah, so, Shabir, yeah. Uh, so, so wrapping the photo library, yeah. Yeah, I think what I'll say with GPU computing is that NVIDIA has a um, has a project called rapids.ai. And what they're doing is they're developing a lot of CUDA-based libraries for data science. And uh, Dask is a primary uh, component of that ecosystem. So they want to express compute as Dask graphs. And, um, but, but then sort of shunt data into GPUs through Dask um, and do compute that way. So I think if you just go and look at rapids.ai, uh, you'll get a lot of information about that. Okay, it looks like my other workers are starting to come up. Yeah, now we've got three. So the work gets distributed over three of these workers. And it looks like it's going on at a reasonable pace. So I'd request that we keep the demo going until it finishes, just that I, so that I can show the final image. Because essentially with the component model, with the LM component model, um, uh, what I've tried to do is uh, predict two point sources of a single chance for each. like to show the image that comes out from that. I think I'll also try and answer Peter's question. Um, I think what's interesting, I think, is that we're developing all these highly optimal codes in isolation. I think, like, for example, the IDG grid, uh, it, it's an amazing piece of accelerated CUDA code. But now we're trying to use all these bits of code in conjunction with each other. and. I don't actually, it, it's interesting to see whether we can get that full performance out of something like an IDG gridder uh, in the, uh, when it's plugged into the uh, into everything else. Okay, so that predict took four minutes on like five dust workers. Um, and now I should be able to print the, uh, plot the image and then you'll see the two sources off center. And I've also, I already mistakenly showed the uh, degridding example where I just created a model image where I uh, said a thousand uh, and a thousand by a thousand region to one. Um, so I think that's a good point to stop the demo. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Um, there, there are still questions coming up. Um, there is one question unanswered on Zoom, but I don't want to keep uh, folks from, from their coffee. So I'm just going to post it on Discord and we could continue discussion there. Um, so thank you very much again, Simon. Um, that concludes our, our this session. I was going to say morning session or, or afternoon session, but that depends on where you are. Uh, thank you very much for to, to, to all our speakers and, and, and for, for, for this demo.
Uh, please, for those of you who are still with us, please be advised that there is a you know, small change in the schedule, uh, that uh, there is a group photo now planned uh, between 4.15 and uh, 4.30 UTC. Uh, so, uh, yeah, to make it maybe easier uh, to convert from the time, 45 minutes before uh, when uh, we were meant to originally start for 15 minutes, there is a group photo opportunity. Um, so, yeah, please, please take note of that. So thank you very much again uh, for, to, for attending this session to all our speakers and to all the attendees. Uh, we had a great turnout. Um, a lot of people uh, asking some great questions. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>